The assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, President of the French Republic. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, President of the French Republic, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, ministers, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to take the floor before this august assembly to bring France's voice. And I'm thinking right now about those who have fought in my country, but also throughout the world, for France to be free. Those people who thought that Europe's destiny could not be indifferent to them before, and those people who come from Africa, from Asia, from throughout the world, because through their freedom, that is what they have achieved. I'm thinking about those people who've written our charter and who've built the walls of this organization to stop the worst when that happened on two occasions in the 20th century that inflicted upon the whole of humanity immeasurable suffering. Let us not ever forget that debt. It serves the interests of all our people and shows us the path of peace. It reminds us that there is no other legitimate center of power that is lasting in nature than that that the, the countries decide upon sovereignly together. It says that the universal nature of our organization is at the service of no hegemony, no geopolitical hierarchy. This legacy, our organization, like our choices as nations, are today, however, confronted with an alternative. Today, we need to make a simple choice, basically, that of war or that of peace. On the 24th of February this year, Russia a permanent member of the Security Council, through an act of aggression, an invasion, an annexation, uh, broke our collective security. It deliberately violated the UN Charter and the principle of sovereign equality of states. From the 16th of March, the International Court of Justice declared the Russian aggression as illegal and it called for the withdrawal of Russia. Russia decided by doing so to pave the way for other wars of annexation in Europe today and perhaps tomorrow in Asia or in Africa or in Latin America. We can say anything we want today, and I hear a lot of discussions, a lot of stances are taken. There is one sure and certain thing. When I am talking to you now, there are Russian troops in Ukraine. And as far as I know, there are no Ukrainian troops in Russia. That is a statement of fact. And we all need to understand that the longer it goes on the uh, worse and more threatening this war is for Europe and the world, it leads us to greater conflict, ongoing conflict, where sec the security and sovereignty of everyone no longer depends on a balance of strength, on the uh, strength of alliances, but rather that of armed groups and militias, those who consider themselves as strong, seek to subject or subjugate all those who they consider as weak. Those who, what we've seen since the 24th of February, is a return to the age of imperialism and col colonies. Ro France rejects this. France obstinately will look and for peace. Our position is clear, and we want to serve this. And so that is why I am engaging in a dialogue with Russia and have done so since the start of the war and 
over these past months, and I will continue to head this up because it's only together that we will find peace. A quest for peace with initiatives taken over the months and years before the conflict, a quest for peace since the 24th of February by the humanitarian, military, and political support that we're providing to the Ukrainian people so that they can enjoy their legitimate right to defense and preserve their sovereignty. The quest for peace by condemning the invasion of a sovereign state and the violation of our collective security principles, war crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine, and by our refusal of impunity. International justice must establish the crimes and uh, condemn and try the perpetrators. The quest for peace through our desire to curb geographic expansionism in war. And here we undertake to support the efforts of the IAEA to prevent the impact of war on the on safety and security of nuclear plants, as we'll do tomorrow beside the Ukrainians uh, whose sovereignty is, and safety is absolutely crucial. We have ensured that a IAEA mission went to uh, Ukraine, establishing its independent report to prevent the risk of an accident whose consequences would be devastating. We are all aware today here that only an agreement that respects international law will enable peace to come back. A negotiation can only be possible if sovereignly Ukraine wants it and Russia accepts it in good faith. We are all aware as well that a negotiation will only be successful if uh, Ukraine is liberated and its sovereignty is protected. Russia must now see that it cannot impose its will militarily even if there are s s fake pretend referenda in territories that have been bombed and are now occupied. It is up to the members of the Security Council to say this loud and clear and to the members of this assembly to support us on our path to peace. I from this podium call upon members of the United Nations to act so that Russia rejects the path of war and assesses the cost for itself and for all of us and really brings an end to this act of aggression. We're not talking about choosing a camp here between the east and the west, either between the north or the south either. What we're talking about is everybody's responsibility, everybody who's committed to the respect of the Charter and our most common precious good, peace. Because over and beyond war, there's a risk of dividing the world that's at stake here with the direct and indirect impact of the conflict. I know that here many cherish a feeling of injustice because of economic, energy, uh, and all the other dramatic consequences because of the war conducted by Russia. I know that there are countries here that have chosen a form of neutrality vis-a-vis -vis this war. Um, with uh, very uh, honestly today, who is um, saying clearly, those who are saying that they're not aligned, they are wrong. They are making a historic um, Era, the combat of the non aligned movement is a combat for peace. They fought for peace, for the sovereignty of states, for the territorial integrity of everybody. The fight for the non of the non aligned, those who are keeping silent today actually are in a way complicit with the cause of a new imperialism, a new order that is trampling over the current order, and there's no peace possible here. Russia is today seeking to uphold a double standard, but the war in Ukraine must not be a conflict that leaves anyone indifferent. It is very close to the Europeans who support chosen to support Ukraine without 
entering war with Russia. It is further off for many of you. Nonetheless, we all are suffering the direct impact of it, and we all have a role to play to bring an end to it, because we're all paying the price of it. By its very uh, foundation, this law, this uh, war rather launched by Russia is undermining the principle of our organization, is undermining the only possible world order, is undermining peace. That which underpins peace, the respect for the intangibility of borders and sovereign nations to this end. Let us not muddle up cause and effect. Who here can defend the idea that the invasion of Ukraine justifies no sanction? Who of you here, who of you here can consider that the day when something similar with a more powerful neighbor happens to you, there'll be silence from the region, from the world. Who can say that's the best solution? Who can believe that Russia just has to win this war for us to move on to something else? Nobody can believe that. Contemporary imperialism is not Western, it's not European. It takes the form of a territorial invasion linked with a hybrid modernized war that uses energy prices, food insecurity, nuclear safety, access to information, and population movements as weapons for division and destruction. And it's there. That is how the war undermines all of our sovereignty. France is standing alongside the free peoples of the UN here to deal with the consequences of the conflict and all the inequalities by rejecting block uh, mindsets or exclusive alliances. Because over and beyond the direct impact of the war, the risk is ours today. It is that of a new partition of the world. Some of us, uh, some people want to say that there are, there's the West that defends outdated interests, and then there's the West of the world that has suffered so much and wants to cooperate uh, by turning a blind eye. And I reject this division for at least two reasons. Firstly, in principle, and I've just mentioned this, our organization has universal values. Let us not be deaf to the fact that there is, or let's not say that there's anything regional or adaptable in the Charter. No, our organization has universal values, and div the division vis a vis the war in Ukraine is simple. Are you in the favor of the law of the strongest, the non-respect for the territorial integrity of countries? Are you for or against impunity? I see no international order nor lasting peace that can be based on the respect of peoples and the principle of responsibility. I see no option apart from that. That is the only order. So our values are universal, and that's why we should never serve a power that violates these principles. Over recent years, when we have taken liberty with these values, we have been wrong. But this can in no way justify trampling on what we have built together after the Second World War. When I hear Russia say that it is ready to work in areas of new cooperation with a new international order with no hege hegemony, well, okay, well, based on what principle? The invasion of borders and non-respect of the borders of those people I don't particularize. Uh, who, what is this order? Who's playing at hegemony today? It is Russia. What are we talking about? What is being invented here today? This is nothing that's going to hold water. Let us not cede to the cynicism that uh, rejects this order that we've built together. And it's the only thing that can hold in stability in our world. The respect for the uh, for borders, for and territorial uh, integrity. We were wrong when we took liberties with all of this. After the Second World War, after colonialism, we built something else. We 
said, no, it's not, uh, we're not having this, we're not accepting this. The second reason for my opposition for this attempt to split up, to have partition in the world, is pragmatic. There are nascent divisions, and over and beyond that, there are attempts to divide the world, to exacerbate any tensions between the United States and China. That is not going to be a new Cold War. There are lots of different powers that are trying to uh, promote regional tensions and push back collective security and promote nuclear developments. I therefore think that we need to do everything that we can to ensure that this division does not occur because what faces us, the challenges facing us, are more urgent and they require new forms of cooperation. Let us look at Pakistan. A third of the country is underwater. Uh, over what, one thousand, many, many people have died and were injured. The Horn of Africa, the worst drought for 40 years, a rainy season which will undoubtedly be even worse. Half of humanity is living in an area of climate danger. Our ecosystems are reaching the point of no return. Let us look at Somalia, at Yemen, at South Sudan, at Afghanistan. Famine is coming back. The food crisis is striking everywhere, and it is affecting the most vulnerable people. M millions of children are facing famine. There are 100 million people displaced between 1999 and 2015. Only, uh, only 130,000 people uh, escape poverty, and so many people today are in conflict-affected countries. Given these crises, climate change, pandemics, the spike in food prices, the most vulnerable people are always the worst affected. Threats are always there over and beyond all that terrorism that affects the Sahel and the Middle East, nuclear proliferation in Iran and in North Korea as well. We have not managed to curb this. These are the things we need to address urgently. And there were all these descriptions that I've just given you, and this list is not exhaustive. But each time when we have shortcomings in our international system, uh, we need to uh, curb, of, curb these problems, uh, and much of these problems are caused by divisions between us. Therefore, it is our shared responsibility, needs to be, must be, to help the most fragile, to m help the most vulnerable, to cope with these challenges. Nahendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, was right when he said, the time is not for war. It is not for revenge against the West or for opposing the West against the East. It is the time for a collective time for our sovereign equal states to cope together with challenges we face. This is why there's an urgent need to develop a new contract between the North and the South, an effective contract which respects is respectful for food, for biodiversity, for education. It's no longer a time for block thinking, but to build a coalition of specific action to reconcile legitimate interests and com common goods. Now on the global food crisis, France has doubled its uh, contributions to the World Food Programme along with the EU. We have solidarity corridors built to evacuate more than 10 million tulls, tons of grain over land since spring. This was usefully complemented by the agreement in June, thanks to the work of the Secretary General of the United Nations, that led to the evacuation of 2.4 million tonnes of grain through the Black Sea. We have the Farm Initiative. This enables vulnerable countries to be uh, have investments in agriculture so they become resilient. I would also like to announce that uh, France will 
finance uh, evacuation of grain to Somalia in partnership with the World Food Programme. We will do that, standing in solidarity effectively, and we have a requirement of full transparency. Tomorrow, we will meet with the African Union, UN agencies, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank and the European Commission to develop a uh, mechanism that can ensure access to grain for Africa. And we support the Secretary General's initiative here on climate and biodiversity. In a few weeks, we will be in Egypt for COP27. Let us be clear here, too about what a just transition means. Our first collective fight is to eradicate coal. The crisis must not let us lose sight of this. If we do not do this, we will exceed still further the two degree centigrade predictions. I am ready to invest in financing coalitions, as we have done with South Africa a few months ago. And we must continue this logic. But China and the great emerging powers must take a clear decision at the COP. This is fundamental. We must, in this regard, build upon and along with the great emerging powers state coalitions with our international financial institutions so as to build full solutions for energy production and changing our production models in industry. Only this can allow such a transition. The G7 must lead by example. The richest countries must speed up their carbon neutrality programs, but also make the effort at to be sober in behavior and share green technologies. You know that in this area you can count upon the European Union. I also believe that we must recognize that for the poorest countries there is a difficulty to act, both against poverty and to speed up the transition. We cannot ask the same of sub-Saharan Africa with our 100 million people who still don't, do not have access to electricity there, as we do of the m big emitters. This is why financial solidarity, technological so solidarity amongst the richest must be bolstered in terms of climate for the poorest countries. We must provide financing, solutions, and speed up this agenda as we were able to do during the pandemic. But we must do this still more effectively and more resolutely. In this context, we must also together protect the carbon, pri the carbon pri no, sink and biodiversity. In Costa Rica, we'll be hosting the United Nations Conference for uh, the Oceans in 2025. We must make this the COP21 of the oceans. On health. We must learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. We must recognize that our first line of defense are the health systems and personnel in the most vulnerable countries. I will underscore this during the World Fund to combat AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. France remain, will remain one of the main contributors to this. We must also ensure that the WHO does set up earlier warning systems which we need to prevent the spread of further viruses. And we must, together, tackle human and animal health. This is the very sense behind the One Health Initiative, which France is leading with a number of others. As we do with the World Partnership for Education, we must continue our efforts so that children go to school after the pandemic, which has deprived them of this. We must fight at the source against all inequality and work for our common future. As you see, in all the areas, we need more cooperation. There must be partnerships of stakeholders between the West and the South, the North and the South. All of this must be developed. Further commitment by our major institutions. All of this is the opposite of division. Who, during the pandemic, was there proposing financing for the climate transition? not those who are now proposing a new international order and who didn't have functional vaccines and who were not in solidarity and who do not contribute anything for the environment. Against all these challenges, which are our shared challenges, we must be, act in solidarity. We must cooperate more, but never 
give way to siren calls which lead nowhere. To achieve this, we must also be lucid about the situation of the poorest countries and middle-income countries, whether these be in Africa, on the South American continent, in Asia or in the Pacific. The pandemic has increased inequalities further. The war and its consequences have increased difficulties for many countries. The G20 must therefore imperatively stick to the, its objective of last year to mobilize $100 billion from special drawing rights. But we must go further. Based upon these special drawing rights issuance by the IMF, we must implement what we have been committed to. So many countries, particularly in Africa, have not yet seen this money. And we cannot explain to them that such and such a parliament is blocking it, such a rule is preventing it. That cannot happen. We are coming too late, but we must go further because the difficulty is still greater. We must therefore go from 30% of reallocation of our special drawing rights to four African countries who are the most vulnerable and the poorest countries everywhere in the planet. And with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, we must recommit our mechanisms, those most appropriate to the current context. The rules which we apply today are those of the 80s. The situation of our planet post-COVID-19, with increased climate deregulation and a collapse of biodiversity because of the imbalances created by the war, this means we need greater solidarity. We must have a new financial compact with the South. That is where we must act. This is where we must move, move, act together, not against a common enemy, against false stories or historical revision, but for the planet in which we all live and for an equal chances at, at a global scale. This fight is our fight, which brings us all together. We need to make a little more effort to stick to our agreements, to be demanding and respectful of one another. But this fight, this is the true fight. If we are not able to wage it together, it will instead be the source of all ruptures and conflicts in the future. I invite all those who wish to build this new contract with us to come to the Paris Forum for Peace on the 11th of November this year to prepare the G20 in Bali and move forward together without ever giving up on our common values and our guiding principles. We must get to the heart of things. We mustn't give in to the fragmentation of the world or the increase of threats to peace. We must not allow crises to multiply and there be a proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. These are all risks which we cannot and will not be able to master in the future if we do not uh, address the most directly concerned major powers. It is this work of involving major powers that we must do in the Middle East by ensuring a follow-up on the Baghdad conference which we held in 2019 for the stability of Iraq or Lebanon and the whole region. The members of the P5 are no longer alone in having their word to say. And if they do have a word to say, then they do. It can only work if we are able to work more broadly towards international consensus, which is so necessary for peace. This is why I hope that we can finally commit to the reform of the Security Council so that it is more representative and welcome new permanent members and remain able to play its full role by restricting the use of the right to veto in terms of mass, in cases of mass crimes. Together, we must build peace and a contemporary international order which acts to the service of the objectives of our Charter. And on this path, the United Nations can unquestionably count upon France. On this path, each country here today can absolutely count upon France. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the French Republic for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.
We have heard the last speaker for this meeting. The fifth plenary meeting will continue the general debate at 3 p.m. The meeting is adjourned.